and Helen and, and Brian for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be able to talk about the book that I published in 2015. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the structure of my presentation today. First, I'm going to introduce the method I used by analyzing these seven Slovak women. Then I'm going, as Brian mentioned, to uh, present two of the seven. That the first is Elena Maroti Šoltesova, and the second Javiva Rajkova, born Adele Rosenbergova. Part three deals with a very brief, it's re really a very superficial and brief comparison with two Czech women, the op uh, opera soprano Emi Destin and my great big friend Eva Mimi Jirankova. In the conclusion, I'm going to recapitulate basically the contents of the book and explain once more why seven historical epochs and why seven Slovak women. It's usually creativity requires inspiration also in, in, my, in my profession. And uh, I never thought about writing or analyzing female stories or female lives. But then I, uh, I got this book by my friend and colleague, Dr. Gabriela Dudekova, Nazistic Moderne Gene on the way toward the modern woman, the modern woman, excuse me, um, chapters from the history of family relations in Slovakia. And if you can get it, it's, it's an absolute gem of a book because it explains to you in, in, with great detail the difference that Slovak women had to face due to the socio-political environment they lived in. So this was my inspiration and this was my result. Seven Slovak Women was the first volume followed by Seven Czech Women. I applied the same method to both nations, to women of both nations. Now, what is feminist historiography? It's the writing of history of a state or a nation or, and or a nation with a focus on women's lives. What biographies are available? What autobiographies have been published? What does the literature, the academic historical literature say about women in a certain, uh, in a certain epoch, in a certain political environment? What uh, do their socioeconomic conditions look like? What about money? Could they earn money? Uh, what kind of jobs had they access to? What career opportunities did they enjoy? And did such thing like a pay gap exist already, for example, in the 19th century or in the early 20th century? Then another aspect of feminist historiography is also the upbringing of girls, especially ethical values. What makes a girl a decent girl? What is the behavior girls had to um, follow to be, be considered acceptable to wider society? A very important aspect is furthermore the education, access to primary school, high school, university, or vocational training. Then the political aspect is, of course, women's political rights, the right to vote, when was it achieved and by whom? I think in the US, uh, it was enshrined in the US constitution, if I'm not mistaken, in 1920, whereas in most of the European states, it was uh, in the constitution by at the end of the First World War, that's 1918. And I hope I'm not going to shock um, um, the audience. I'm living in a state, I'm a citizen of a state who enshrined the women's vote in 1971. So a lot later than the rest of Europe. But um, to praise the women two generations prior before my generation could enjoy this right to vote, they achieved it with their own lobbying. So they convinced basically the Swiss men, look, we uh, do not want any longer to be treated as second class citizen. We want the right to vote. And by 1971, the majority of men, because women were not allowed to participate in that vote, of course, uh, the majority of Swiss men uh, said, yes, we are going to give you the vote. So since then, women are um, 
in constitutional terms and political rights equal to men in my country. Then women and the law, a further aspect, for example, equality in legal procedures, then property rights, what property rights could women enjoy, which one not yet uh, inheritance laws, and of course the right to abortion when we're talking laws. As I showed you on Gabi Dudekova's cover, feminist historiography is sometimes often referred apologetically as the history of family relations. I think this is because feminism today has, is kind of like, um, it's not an attractive concept anymore, the words. So to avoid femin the concept feminism that has a bad reputation, uh, many scholars use the term history of family relations. Now, I'm going to explain my method. It's contextual, but this is the second part of the method. My method is a blend. It's an interdis interdisciplinary blend between feminist historiography and contextual biography. I quote, any attempt to incorporate such themes, technology, demography, prosperity, democratization, ecology, political violence, in a history of 20th century Europe would not bypass the role of key individuals who helped to shape the epoch. They are neither their prime cause nor their inevitable consequence. New biographical approaches which recognize this are desirable, even necessary. Their value will be, however, in using biography as a prism on wider issues of historical understanding and not in a narrow focus on private life and personality. So what Sir Ian Kershaw explains here is the method, we are not interested, and he's the most famous Hitler biography ever, a fantastic biography by Ian Kershaw. We are not interested in Hitler's favorite color or what kind of pyjama he preferred, but we want to understand Hitler as a person with biographical data within the political environment he lived in and which he influenced. That is basically the bottom line of his biography in the historical context when that person lived. The way toward the modern women in five stages of development. When we look at women's development, we find five stages. That is, so to speak, our basis. That's the historical context. It's the big picture, the big overview. First, women began the conquest of the public space. That means they uh, were no longer confined to the house. They could go out of the house. They could uh, uh, meet other women, other people in society, in clubs, in associations, go to the caverna, go to a museum. This happened in the second half of the 19th century. Second phase is the right to higher education. That means access to high schools and universities. This happened after World War I. Universities were open to women and high schools to get the maturita, the high school diploma. The third phase is the right to political participation. That means the right to vote and run for office, engage in political activities such as forming, a, forming an own political party. This also happened after World War I in the early 20th, cent, early 20th century in the interwar period, I would say. The fourth phase is the access and the right to work and earn a salary. That means financial independence. Women could now, they were no longer forced uh, to get married, to be dependent on a husband who brought in uh, the means of biological survival, the food, the household, early 20th century. Um, the right to work, this is perhaps, um, I should add here, communist, constitution had enshrined the right to work. That meant it was the state's duty to employ you and employ every citizen, also women. So everybody was 100% employed and, over, and of course got, was paid for it. Although 50% of the employment was not productive in economic terms. And last but not least, uh, phase five, the right to prevent pregnancy with a contraceptive pill and the right to legal abortion. That's the second half of the 20th century. 
I can vividly uh, remember when I was, I think I was a teenager, 11, 12, 13 years old, when uh, the German, it was a kind of uh, a news magazine, a weekly, Der Stern, published a cover with very famous actresses, singers, politicians, all women, and on the cover was uh, the slogan, wir haben abgetrieben, we had had abortions. And this was back then, that was illegal. And that caused such a, a societal um, discussion that um, shortly, I think two or three years later, West Germany, of course, that was in West Germany, uh, enshrined the right to legal abortion in paragraph 218 into the constitution. In the states of the Soviet bloc, of course, especially in the Soviet Union, um, abortion was considered, women considered abortion as a kind of like a contraception because nobody wanted uh, to expose one's body to the, the, the hormonal bomb that the Soviet pill had been. So they rather, women rather got pregnant and then had a state paid abortion if the family planning was already done when they were done with and had their two, two children. Now, this is a feminist par excellence, uh, a real liberator of women, Dr. Karl Gerasi is the father of the contraceptive pill. And what does that mean, liberator of women? In the context of the planning of my biography, the pill liberated women, they could now plan their careers. They did not fall, un, uh, fall unwantedly pregnant any longer. And they could plan not only family, but also their career and their lives. So they were a lot more safer with regard to their own biography and their life planning. Now, why seven Slovak women? I've mentioned it before already because of seven political regimes. The history of Czechoslovakia, the Czech part as much as the Slovak part can be structured as follows. First, we have the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Then the only democracy in Central Europe, the Masaryk's First Republic, that was being ended by Nazi aggression. In Slovakia, we had, of course, the clerical fascist Tiso regime. There's been lately a criticism of the concept clerical fascist, but I still think, although the communists invented it, I still think this is the most precise description of the Tiso regime because it explains the blend, the ideological blend between Catholic catechism, the rule of the clergy, with, with a blended with fascist elements of the German Nazi regime. We have three brief years of a semi democracy, post war Czechoslovakia, followed by the as the communists used to call it, the Vitesni Unor, uh, 25th uh, February 48, the victorious February, when the Communist Party pushed itself to power. Communism lasted until the Velvet Revolution of 1989, and what then followed was the Federation. The, the Slovaks finally got the um, amount of autonomy they were, had been looking for. And last but not, the last phase is, of course, sovereign Slovakia, the Velvet Divorce that uh, Mitya and Klaus agreed upon in the summer of 1992. And since 1st of January, uh, Slovakia is an independent state until today. And um, since 1980, 1998, I think Slovak diplomacy that very skillfully described its recent history is speaking of a success story. I think they're right. Slovakia, modern Slovakia today is a success story in political and also economic terms, accession to NATO, EU membership. We're coming to part two. This is Elena Maroti Šoltesova, a chairwoman and activist for the Slovak Women's Association, Shivena. You see to the left uh, a young Elena with this typical, absolutely horrible, um, horrible costumes women had to wear with these corsets. And one just looking at it, uh, one almost cannot breathe. They had to wear this uh, every day. 
so in fashion, in terms of fashion, we could uh, add that Coco Chanel was a feminist in fashion because she liberated women from this corset and designed fashion without a corset. She liberated the female body. To the right, we see Elena in her garden shortly before she died uh, in much more comfortable clothes, the white coat, and um, she looks pensive. That's all I can say about it. Jivena was founded in 1869 in Turchansky Svati Martin. Since 53, this is, uh, Martin is referred to as Martin only because of course the communists got rid of the Turchansky Svati. The, 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 the religious name. And, and especially uh, the education of girls in Upper Hungary was problematic. I don't know what I'm doing now. I don't know. Because of the assimilation. First, the first high school for girls opened in Budapest in 1896. So what does this mean for Slovak girls? There was not one um, high school or one university on the Slovak settled territory in Upper Hungary. So if I, as a young girl, wanted to study medicine, I had to study it in Budapest, or I could go to Prague and study in Czech, because in 1882, the uh, Charles University opened up a Czech-speaking section. So most of young Slovak intellectuals went to Prague to study in Czech. The Slovak national movement established it, had established itself in 1861 with the memorandum, and it was an integrating movement against the Hungarian assimilation. They wanted the language rights. They did not speak yet of a succession out of, the, of Upper Hungary to leave Hungary to become an independent sovereign state. That was not the plan. They just wanted to save their language rights, which they thought that is, is natural law. It's a given by natural law that we are allowed to speak our language, that we don't have to speak and communicate in Hungarian. And to everybody who ever tried to learn Hungarian, it's really understandable. Hungarian is incredibly complicated to study. I gave up. Elena was the chairwoman of Shivina from 1894 to 1927. And her principal task, as she saw it, was the fight against alcoholism. I quote, do we not much too often witness how a poor laborer who could feed with his modest earnings, not only himself, but also his wife and children, drinks away his salary on payment day. And at home, then there is only poverty, quarreling, crime and desperation. In the villages, peasants drink away their land and property condemning their wives and children to poverty." End of quote. With regards to emancipatory goals, liberation of women or, uh, pro, in terms of progressive feminism, Jivina was not successful. She remained a conservative women's association, mainly because men were told women in the board what to do and what to think. No emancipatory endeavors, therefore. And the main problem, as often in when we look at Slovak history, were the finances. They could scrape by, they pro, um, let's try again next week, the next issue, or next month. Um, fundraising, they, they just try to, to keep it going, to keep the, keep the journal, Shivena, and the association going. And Elena about Jivena, the association and the review, the journal, I quote, she did not want to die, but was not allowed to live, end of quote. So you see, see kind of like a, an in-between state, very, very stressful for those members who had to do the fundraising. My sec the second woman I'm going to present today is Khabibar Aikova, born Adele Rosenbergova. And you see that here on the, on the file, on the slide, she got only 30 years old. So to the left, all pictures are downloaded from Wikipedia. Young Adele in her native Slovakia. And to the right, you see wearing a uniform of the British Royal Air Force. So that picture was taken 
shortly because she landed in the Povstaletske territory in the SNP territory in Slovakia. She was born today, it's called Nadabula in central Slovakia. That's uh, probably one or 90 minutes drive from Banska Bistrica. She was an ardent Zionist since she was a teenager and decides in 39 when the Tiso regime takes over to emigrate to Palestine. She did that, I think, with, with friends from her Zionist youth group. Her mother and her brothers stayed behind in Slovakia. She first lives in a kibbutz. They try to, um, to produce some cosmetics with salt from the Dead Sea. And then she learns from a friend who, is, who came back from Tito's Yugoslavia that there is something in the making, an uprising is in the making in Slovakia. And she trains with the British Army. Already there, she has made the decision I'm going back, I'm going to help. And um, her training involves parachutism and um, operating, um, operating a radio operator. And she's, ex uh, she's trained by, uh, and then later operates for churches, special operations executive. A couple of weeks before the launching of the SNP on 29th August 44, she's now, she now calls herself Ada Robinson. And you see, this is a very clever thing the SOA did in terms of psychology. We never forget our initials, JB. In order not to slip up or not to betray our false identity, they kept their initials Adele Rosenberger and just found other names, names, cover names, made up names, Ada Robinson, uh, but the initials remain the same. And she lands in Tridubi Airport close to Banska Bistrica from the Zionist partisan group and broadcasts for the uprising. So the motivation for her to go back to Slovakia was to get as many Jews, Slovak Jews out or save lives. And of course also to resist the, because the Nazi, Nazis had brought in from Hungary more troops to, to end the uprising. She is arrested with her Comrades probably betrayed to the Nazi authorities and the Gestapo on 31st October. She's, for two weeks, she's tortured every day by the Gestapo and then shot in Krenicka and mass buried there. They found after the war, huge mass graves, I think between 200 and 300 women, men and children. Now a brief comparison, a brief superficial comparison with two Czech women. The first one is the, as I mentioned, opera soprano Emmy Destin. To the left, you see young Emmy with this lovely, lovely brown hair. And, uh, oh, sorry. And here uh, she's older at the peak of her career. She sang for kings and queens. She was very successful. She made a lot of money. Um, that was shortly before uh, let's say 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. And she was, when you listen to her, she reminds me immediately of the, the voice of Maria Callas. She made bad decisions, Amy. Although she was an ardent Czech patriot and supported Masaryk's mafia uh, by smuggling in her costumes, she sued them in her costumes, uh, information to US Czechs living in the in the US to organize uh, the lobbying for independent Czechoslovakia. And she supported the independence movement with everything she could do. Yet when the First Republic was founded, she was out of a job and she could not get a job. She could have emigrated to live to New York. She was rich enough. She bought a castle in, in Straj, it's called, I think it's in Southern Bohemia married a completely wrong man who just was busy spending all her money and she ended up poor, so poor that to make ends meet, to feed herself. The star who had once sang at the Metropolitan Opera in New York had to sing in the breaks in a Prague cinema. That's how she ended, very painful to look at her fate. 
I mentioned in my book, Seven Czech Women, this is just a hypothesis. Uh, at the age of 12 or 13, when she was training in Prague to become a singer, there was one day she tried to commit suicide. I think there was something with her sexuality. She probably was a lesbian because um, she tried, she married a complete, we probably would say a beta male, a, a complete loser who just lived off her to gain, gain what in society still then was considered, um, let's say, a normal, a normal relationship with a man to be married. That was the social norm back then. It didn't do her and her money any good. The second woman is my big friend, Efamimi Jirankova, who died when this book came out. She couldn't witness it anymore, but she is on the cover of the Seven Czech Women. To the left, you see a portrait of her, young Mimi, 17, 16, eight years old, made by Czech photographer Ladislav Sietensky. I think she was here on the way to, it was summer holidays and she went hiking to Slovakia. I don't remember the proper circumstances any longer. She was an ardent skier. She was very sporty. She played ice hockey in the winter. She skied and back then there were no ski lifts. She walked up and then uh, rode down on her skis. She played tennis, she played football. And that's probably one of the reasons but she was an extremely strong woman not only mentally, but also physically. The last time she went downhill skiing with her, nephew, with her, with her grandson and his um, friends, she was 80 years old in Switzerland. So with Mimi, we shared not only our love for skiing because I'm an ardent skier as well, but also our second hobby was to meet up in a pub, have a couple of glasses of wine and chat. And we chatted about history and her life. And her life was, she was probably the only woman whose husband was arrested by the Gestapo in the Reading night. Milos was arrested and thanks to the good connection of Mimi's father, who was a lawyer and quite wealthy, they bribed the authorities in Auschwitz so he could work in the Schreibstube. So he had a better chance of survival. He survived Auschwitz. In 45, he came back. He survived also the death march, joined the American army, the US army, liberating the Czech part of, to be restituted Czechoslovakia, came home to Prague and immediately went back to his old job. He was the owner of the very famous center-right um, daily newspaper, Lidove Novini. Uh, in its, let's say it, we can, we could probably compare it to the New York Times and the Neue Zürcher Zeitung. So uh, um, a newspaper of very high intellectual and political standing. They, when the communists, took over in 48, they first tried to flee through the Schumawa with the little daughter, Tina, who was one year old. They were caught and brought back. Mimi landed in the Bartolomejska Stiri, the political police. That still exists. Um, the atmosphere in that Bartolomejska still is very, very odd when you go and visit Prague. Uh, they finally were let out by the authorities. There was an amnesty and some communists um, Minister said everybody who does not want to live in communist Czechoslovakia is allowed to leave. They left. They had to pay to sell everything. The whole wealth was being taken away from them. But they escaped with the daughter and they were really, really very poor. They escaped, um, landed in Bavaria, went with other Czechs who also fled and left the country to Paris. There was a little Czech exile community in Paris. And after three years, Milos finally found a job at the Czech desk and in the British Foreign Ministry uh, as an, an analyst. Then they moved to London and from London after their Miller's pension to Devon, where I met her for the first time. And she, they have been living in Devon ever since. Another further tragic detail of Mimi and Miller's life is that only I think a month before the Velvet Revolution set off in Prague, Milos died of a heart attack, but he had, um, so Mimi told me, a, a happy death because he died of laughter, basically. A, a friend came and told him some, some, some joke and Milos had to laugh so hard that he got a heart attack and died. Now I'm finishing. 
The conclusion, seven Slovak women. I have told you already about Elena Maroti, excuse me. Scholtesova, the organization of women, the first uh, association of women in the Slovak national movement. Then Maria Belova, she was, she was the first female physician in Slovakia, but because she had studied in Budapest and Berlin, uh, she also had a hard time to find a job and employment in Slovakia in the First Republic because um, Czechoslovak patriots said, oh, you studied under the old regime in Budapest. No, we are not going to hire you. Whereas a, a friend of her, a male, who had studied exactly at the same university in Budapest, medicine, was already primar, that means chief physician, in a hospital, I think it was in Kozice. So she had a hard time finding employment and uh, spe specialized later in the treatment of tuberculosis. Kavi Barajkova, I mentioned her, a Jewish Slovak patriot. Anna Čtvrtecka, Čtvrtecka, until today, and I really tried to find out as much as I could. She was a historian, a historian of the Communist Party and a party member and fell victim to Husak's normalization. She lost her employment uh, because she criticized the Soviet invasion and the politics of normalization. The fifth representative is Magdalena Vasharyova. You certainly know her, a wonderfully looking actress, a sociolo trained sociologist and politician. And she was the first Czechoslovak diplomat after the Velvet Revolution and is currently chairwoman of Živina. Živina is still alive, more alive and more kicking than it ever was. There is a known web page. If you Google Živina, you will be directed to the web page and you can see in what kind of um, events they, they organize, uh, what, they, uh, what they are con considered to be problems they need to tackle until today. The sixth symbol or perhaps representative of this uh, phase six of the historical epoch is Iveta Radicova. That is the Czechoslovak uh, democracy, uh, the Federation. She was the first female Slovak prime minister, naturally later than in sovereign Slovakia, also a trained sociologist and the first female university professor in sociology. And the last phase, the phase of sovereign Slovakia is to me, Adela Banashova Vinceova, a TV presenter, and she is to me simply the face of young Slovakia. Very educated, very cultured, um, it, incredibly successful. I heard that she's especially loved by Roma children in the East, eastern part of Slovakia and the Roma children might not know what Coca-Cola is, but they all know Adela Banashova, Vinciava. Now, what all these women have in common, and that's why I titled the book Humanism, Courage and Enlightenment, nobody forced them to do what they did. Maroti Šoltesova could have had a very quiet life at home as a, as a wife. She didn't have any children, but she was also an author writing children's book. Why take up the burden to organize Shivina to go begging for money all the time? She did not have to do that. She did it because she thought it was the right thing to do. Maria Belova could have perhaps stayed in Hungary because she knew Hungarian and got an easy job, got a, more easily a job in Hungary. But she came back to Slovakia to help out, to promote medicine in Slovakia, the Slovak part of Czechoslovakia. Khabiba Raikova could have stayed in what back then was Palestine. She could have founded a family, children, could have perhaps studied, get an education, helping, supporting the foundation of the state of Israel and embark on a political career. She decided to fight in the Slovak national uprising. Anna Čtvrtecka could simply have just not opened her mouth. Go with the flow, don't say anything against the party and you keep your job. No, she couldn't be bothered. She said what she thought was also the right thing to do. The same with uh, Mrs. Vasharyova and Iveta Radicheva. Magdalena Vasharyova, she could have emigrated. She was an actress. She was well-known in Europe, also in America and perhaps 
um, start a second international career as an actress. No, she stayed in the country. Iveta Radicova got a stipend to Oxford, I think in the 90s. She could have stayed in Great Britain, pursue an academic career there. No, she came back to support Slovak politics. And Adela Banashova, she got so many offers from German television because she speaks fluently German. She couldn't be bothered, she wanted to stay in Slovakia. Adela also speaks English, so the path towards an international career in Europe uh, were open to her. She decided to stay in Slovakia and live her life in her native country. So they all made their own decisions. Nobody forced them to do what they then did and embarked on. And I'm taking the opportunity to announce the publication of my next political biography. This is going to be the first ever. No biography of Ponitska exists in Slovak. And this is going to be published uh, April, May, 2022. The focus of this biography lies on one year in the life of Hanna Ponitska, her Anus Mirabilis, Anus Horribilis, excuse me, Anus Horribilis 1977, when she was psychologically tortured by the STB, the Staten Vespitschnost. And here just an excerpt from the book. I quote, after six hours of interrogation by STB agents in November 77 at the Virginia Bespitschnos headquarters in Bratislava. Tell me now, what do you want from me? She asks the interrogator. And he says, retract your contribution to the discussions of the third conference of the Writers' Union. That was the big thing they wanted her to retract. Because in that, in that uh, contribution, she criticized the regime or else you can leave. No, I did not mean it like that. He held me back when I was about to get up and go home, abroad. We let you out, end of quote. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm now looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Josette. Okay, I will check the chat to see if there's any questions uh, in there. Um, all right, uh, I have a, <clears throat> okay, I will call on, uh, we do have, uh, uh, I'll open up the floor to, uh, well, the first question will go to, to Helen Fedor. Hel Helen, if you could unmute yourself. Okay. Um... Oh, we're going to leave the uh, uh, the title um, the title screen. Um, yes, I had a question about uh, Marati Sholtesova. Um, mm -hmm. What is her background? Was she the? I seem to remember something about maybe her she being the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, um, and you said that Jivana was only allowed to hold conservative views. Um, what were her personal beliefs, her personal politics? Uh, that's a very good question. I think she was in, in certain respects, uh, you're you right, she, her father was a Protestant or, or Lutheran pastor. Uh, she was not, let's say, courageous enough to stand up against the, the men who were also chairmen of Jivena. So she just... Um, she was also a poet, quite introverted, I remember. And she thought what she can achieve on her own, circum quasi circumventing um, what the man wanted Shivana to be. Uh, a little women's news uh, review and a little women's club, especially Horban Vajansky, who was very conservative. He was for many years, uh, the chair, one of the chairmen of Shivena. And he, of course, this dictated. Urban Vajansky was so full of himself that he, um, he boycotted many well-written texts by women because he thought, oh, these little women, they are not, only men can be great writers, only men can be great poets. So he basically boycotted his own organization, if you want to put it like that. And she, I think, 
and I'm trying to put myself into the mindset of, of her, um, who you want to go every day of your life and you can't win. It's a battle you cannot yet win. Was, had she given up, had she lived longer or born later, she probably would have, uh, especially when Masaryk's uh, democracy was founded, which gave, uh, put women on the same equal uh, legal level like, like men, then she would have had the law behind her. And she could have argued against the men, look, no, this is a women's association. You are men, you certainly are entitled to your own opinion, but also consider our opinion. We are women, we know what you're talking about. I think that's kind of the, the mindset we have to imagine. And in times also, I think what she might have considered, we are so few Slovaks, we have to, already problems fighting and the Slovak national movement was divided. They were not united yet. They were so divided into Catholics, into Protestants, into conservatives. Then you have the classists, Masaryk's adherents uh, who had all studied in Prague and that national movement was already divided enough. And I could, I could imagine that uh, Elena said, uh, okay, we are a small nation. We are bundling our forces. If I now come, and put the female perspective, this is another division. This is going to divide us even more. So that would, I would think that she considered that and then just went along. She might also have thought it is not yet the time. The time is not yet right. Because as I mentioned before, the Slovak national movement after 61, they did not want sovereignty. They could not even think in terms of sovereignty. The only chance of becoming, achieving that kind of sovereignty was with the foundation of Czechoslovakia. Before that, no chance whatsoever to go against powerful Hungary, the powerful um, liberal party in Budapest, no chance. No. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, the next question it will, will come from uh, Susan Mikola. Susan? Oh. Hi, Josette. It's, Hi, uh, Susan. It's, Great to see you. Hi. I hope you're going to be at ACs. Are you coming in for ACs? No, oh. I can't. No, no, it's too dangerous. Although I'm vaccinated, I can't. I, I really, no. <laughs> oh, well, that's too bad because I, I, you've done a terrific job and I want to compliment you on the on the presentation and on the, on the book. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading it. One of the things as a historian, you know, one of the things that we often, often overlook, and that's why I teach a woman's history class, because nobody asks, what were the women doing? The assumption mm -hmm. is that we were in the house taking care of the kids and cooking. Um, and so I think it's really important. Um, do you think that there's been a significant kind of um, equality of women with, uh, Radichova with Chaputova now and everything that uh, Slovakia is more advanced in terms of accepting women in leadership role than let's say the United States, which still, you know, barely has scratched the mm -hmm. uh, surface of leadership, finally with a female vice president. But so is Slovakia more um, kind of gender equality type? It's a, it's, it's a very fascinating question because you could say yes for a certain aspect and um, whether we like it or not, we have to thank the communists for that because the communists put the legal basis, everybody's equal, everybody's equally unfree under communism, but they were equal. So um, men made as much money or as, let's put the salary away as women. So that gave women already quite a good a kind of like self-confidence. We are here, we're making the same amount of money. Um, don't mess us about um, these times are over. Certainly, we have to thank the communists for that. And I think, especially when you mentioned Vasharyova and Radicheva, yes, absolutely, because they both grew up under communism. Radicheva, um, she was 13 in 68. I think uh, Vasharyova was a little bit older, but they were both teenagers. So they have a very good memory of these communist times and that gave them the power uh, to embark on 
shaping the politics of independent Slovakia because they knew what was at stake. When Mechiar was still in power, both they knew, hey, this is going backwards. This is not good. Mm -hmm. And then they formed this coalition with Zurinda, who then won the parliamentary election. With the US, I'm, I think there are so many factors different in US politics. I find it hard to make a judgment on that, honestly, because I don't know. You need a lot of money to run, right, for office. That's one factor. You don't need that much money in Slovakia. Then you need to, um, it's huge. The US is a continent. Um, it's, you basically cannot compare it to such a small 5 million people in Slovakia. Although you have the technology, um, I would not, I, you can of course compare everything, but it uh, makes this comparison sense. We have to ask ourselves then, does it make sense to compare these completely different socioeconomic and political conditions and the oldest demo democracy in the US to a democracy, a young European Union state and democracy Slovakia? I don't know. My American female friends, I never got the impression that, is, on the contrary, I thought American feminists did a lot, especially in the 60s and 70s, to educate their sons with respect for women. In Europe, that is not the case, especially not in Switzerland. In Switzerland, mothers still think, oh, this my son, uh, my gold, my gold boy, and nobody's ever been good enough for him and stuff like that. So these old patterns, you know, of female thinking. I think the American families are much more advanced than the European ones. But I, I find it hard to compare. I can just, I can just point out the differences, but then comparing these, I don't know much enough. I don't know enough about uh, American feminism. Yeah, no, and I, I didn't mean to compare directly, but rather this notion of um, the role of women in society. And you're right, it was the communist experience that mm -hmm. really, really was a key factor in um, developing that. Um, I have to leave because I have another Zoom meeting uh, <laughs> at, through the university, but thank you so much. This was great. I can't wait to read your book. And if not this year at ACs, maybe next year in ACs. Let's hope. Thank you very much for coming, Susan. Okay. Thank you. Great to see Bye. you. Great to see you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> if you'd like to ask a question directly of, uh, of Josette, uh, you, you can unmic yourself or unmute yourself. All right, let me jump in with a second question. Um, <clears throat> for both of these women, Josette, what role did their religion play in, um, whether positive or negative, um, in their work or their aspirations um, or even their accomplishments? For Haviva, certainly she was a modern Jew. She was an adherent of Zionism. So, um, that, that was a big part, a large part of her being a female at Zionist and um, believing that one day there would be a state of Israel in what then back then was called Palestine. That motivated her to emigrate. Had she been perhaps an adherent of Judaism, and I don't really know, I'm not an expert in religion, not at all, she might have um, stayed and ended up like her brother, brothers and her mother in a concentration camp and died there. But I think this uh, Zionism was to Jews a modernizing, I wouldn't say ideology, it was a modernizing body of thought and that motivated her. I, I strongly believe that that was the principal source of her motivation also then later to come back. No, she could have stayed in Palestine, nobody forced her. She came back and fought. And to, about Elena, Certainly she was a believing Christian. She believed in the Christian message or the Christian message that um, you have to take care of others, to love others as much as you love yourself. So this kind of like 
this humanism, this Christian humanism. She does not talk often about religion or her belief in God. To her, it was completely, it was like um, a, a one aspect of her life, which she used. That was also like for Haviva Zionism to Elena, it was probably the, the, the motivation to be more active. Not only to sit at home and pray on Sunday in church, but to do more. I, otherwise, I could, she was not a modernist. Otherwise, she would have st stepped up against Vyansky. Mm. She was an introvert, not a religious fanatic, no. But uh, I think a Christian belief, a Protestant belief was solid, dominating in that that it motivated her to do Christian work, love of the next. And that was practical, practical love of the next. To educate people, to educate women, how to have, keep your house clean. That the fight against alcoholism, a huge problem in Slovakia in the last decades of the 19th century. Uh, a third of the Slovak nation lived in the US. Also Dubček's parents, they emigrated and he was born in the US. They then, later came back, but um, apart from Upper Hungary in the Hungarian kingdom, most ma the major part of the Slovaks who identified themselves as Slovaks were living in the US and the East Coast, where they found work um, in the forests and uh, like the Czechs also, coal mining, so these manual works. Yeah. But I would say um, to conclude to both of them, to Haviva, her Zionism, and to Elena, her Protestantism were motivating factors, although they don't mention it often. Yeah. So we have a question from Karen. Her question is, how would you describe the current position of women in academia in Slovakia? I think um, in some in some disciplines there are more women than men, especially for example the the example I know best is the Historicki Ustav Slovenski Akademie Vied, the Institute of History of the Slovak Academy of Sciences. I would have to count, but there are when you look at uh, um, the employment um, stuff. There are 50 50, I would say, women and men, young women, elderly women, all trained historians with a PhD from the university. And then they get into the academy, which is um, highly professional, on a, operating on a very high scientific level. I don't know about uh, medicine. I think there's also probably at par men and women. And yeah, that's the only thing I, in, in academic research, Slovakia, I, I can't say, give any, any, any figures, but I got the impression at the moment it's 50 to 50. It depends, of course, um, what kind of physics or, or astronomy, what, what kind of discipline you're looking at. Sorry that I can't be more precise on that. All right, the next question comes from uh, Michael. His comment and question is, you talked about communism introducing equality of the sexes, but men dominated the leading positions in the, in the communist party and most enterprises. And most enterprises were still headed by males. How do you explain this? Um, with uh, let's say the triple burden of women under communism. They had not only to bring up the children, 100% uh, being employed, 100% in the workforce, mm. but also when you just uh, look at, for example, Christmas, you have to go shopping, you have to queue, because this takes up a lot of time. Mrs. Vasharyava told me when her children were small, she spent hours just to find oranges or acceptable meat shopping. So this is a lot of time investment, it's stressful. You have to bring up the children, okay? They go to the školki, to the kindergarten and later to school. They are taking 
children are taken care of, but who cleans the house? Who takes care of the garden of your um, weekend, Khatya? Of course, men and women equally enjoyed there if they had a weekend Khatya in the, the countryside. But uh, to embark on a career in the Communist Party by there were so few women, I think it has to do with the triple burden of the household, the children. Then also, don't forget also the grandparents. The grandparents need to be taken care of, although there were certainly there were houses for pensioners. But then to muster up the energy to embark on a political career under communism, and that means that involves going to every meeting, study, educate yourself in the minute details of Marxism, Leninism, Follow the party line. What did the party line? What did the line of the party look like every, every given moment? What what is coming from Moscow? How can we uh, a kind of like implement that in, in Czechoslovakia? I think this would have been too much of a stress for women, and that's that's the only explanation I can offer for um, yeah. Besides of Anna Stvrtička, who was an academic, not a party member, she was not a career party member. There were really, I don't, nothing, no name comes to mind of a, a communist female functionary. You're absolutely right with that regard. And so, the explanation, explanation is the, the, the triple burden on women. The women that did advance, would you say that those were the ones that didn't have families and that chose not to marry for the most part? I don't know of any woman making a career in the Communist Party. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is I, I, I know there are no in the upper none in the upper echelons. I've never mm -hmm. seen them. Mm -hmm. And even in most organizations, they're usually assistants. Yeah. Not heading yeah. that organization. Yeah. Or, for example, in the Zhensky, uh, in, in, in the, the Communist Women's Club or Communist, there were, there were women, uh, there were teachers, but um, I don't know, I cannot give you one name. I cannot, no name comes to mind. But it's a very good question, of course. I, I, don't, I will admit, though, when I was interrogated by the secret police when I was living in Slovakia, uh, my interrogator was a woman, so that's that's interesting. But I'm sure you know she wasn't at the top. You know, she was mm -hmm. responding mm -hmm. to superiors, and maybe they thought I'd respond to a woman more honestly or something like that. And that's that's another very interesting uh, chapter um, with regard to psychology. You know, um, Hanna Ponitska was also when she had to strip naked. Of course, they did not do that. She did not have to do that in front of men. But they had a 19-year-old girl. A 19-year-old girl. Imagine how young already working for the STB in Bratislava. So they recruited probably from really faithful communist families and the perks that came with such a career, we don't know. I just guess there were very good perks coming with an STB job. Mm. Yeah. I have looked at on the Czech side, they have this fantastic research uh, in the ABS Archiv uh, Bezpečnostich Složek in Prague. And when you go on their web page, they have, I think, registered most of the female STB agents who made a career. But I have not, I did not have time to look deeper into that matter. And none of my Czech colleagues have so far. But that would be actually a fascinating analysis to look at career paths in the STB for women. When did they start? Where, how were they were recruited? How far did they get along? Where were they trained? On some, some kind of like castle that was, of course, everything was kept secret. Nobody had to know, were allowed to know. And how did they combine this life in secrecy with a family? You know, I mean, from East Germany, we know that uh, often Stasi, informal Mitarbeiter, informal collaborators, they spied on their own wives and betrayed them, but the, the, the psychological manipulation was so masterfully done that they could convince them. We learn a lot about that interrogation stuff from text from Havel, Václav Havel, that they could convince people who are not that savvy or not that intelligent or were more frightened than others. Look, you can help your wife only if you tell us what she's doing. You can save her. What husband would not sign? Then you sign and voila, that's it. You are informal Mitarbeiter. 
And that's, that's, that's how this, you don't need millions. Uh, my colleague, esteemed colleague, Juraj Marosiak, I think he estimates the Slovak STB, Slovak STB, there were no more than 11 to 12,000 people employed to watch over 5 million. But as, as I mentioned, that would be a fantastic research project, trajectories of female STB careers. That would be, that would be fantastic. All right, I, I'll ask the ne next question. So Josette, uh, you, one of the women you profiled was involved in the uh, SNP. Um, can you say, I mean, was, was there a great deal, were women, were there a, additional women you came across in research that were active in the SNP or was the, the woman you profiled kind of a, an exception to, to that? She was an exception because um, she came back. She emigrated to Palestine, she came back and she was on the fighting front. But there is a, in communist times, there is a publication about women in the SNP. So what women did during the SNP, those who lived in the, in the territory where the uprising took place, they helped. They helped the partisans. They gave them food, they cooked for them, they brought food. They took care of those who were wounded because they first, first aid, Purva Pomots. They uh, were working as couriers, bringing, bringing information. Uh, many women were involved and, and they suffered. <laughs> the Germans had no mercy at all. They had no mercy. I know of one case of an elderly lady, a widow, who I think she gave shelter to two young partisans, young Slovak boys, uh, and hid them in the cellar. Somebody betrayed her or the Gestapo found out she was burnt alive in her house. And I saw that that ruin that is in uh, uh, in the north of Banska Bistrica when I visited the hut of uh, my friend who were Vavoshova and the, the vessel twins. Uh, they drafted that text, the Viklaška, the official call to arms of all Slovak men. And many defected, many defected from the German army and joined the partisans in the mountains because by 44, autumn 44, the Allied had, Allies had already landed in Normandy. The Red Army was closing in. Uh, to everybody, it was clear this war is going to be end with a victory by the Allies, but not when, not when. So what the SNP, they started the uprising, the, Main reason for the start of the uprising was because the Germans were, were now acting as an occupying force in Slovakia. So you have to imagine uh, for five years, uh, the Germans are telling the Tisa government, oh, you are our most faithful ally, like the Croats, the Croatian Ustasha regime was also considered an ally, but in Nazi ideology, they were treated, I mean, the top echelons of Tisa's party were treated kind of allies, but in the German mind, only as long as they would need them. And once Germany would have won the war, they were slaves, they were superhumans. There's no discussion. They would have all ended up as slaves working in the fields, like the Nazi ideology projected. So women were heavily engaged, yes. In the, but with, 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 uh, with uh, typical female, uh, not fighting in the front, uh, not in military terms, but in support, in a supportive role, yeah. All right. Um, let me check the chat here real quickly, see if there's any additional questions. Um, All right. Um, if anyone has a question, please unmute yourself. You can you can ask Josette directly. Well, I guess I'll ask the next next question. So, um, 
So you mentioned, well, the one of the ladies you profiled or women you profiled was uh, Raditsova. Um, and I know recently Slovakia has um, the, the current president is, is a, is a is, I guess, would, I believe is the first female president. Yeah, Slovakia. yeah. Susana Chaputova, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the current, I mean, I don't know if you can comment on the current Slovak political landscape is, are there in the current parties, are there, are, women, are there are, are there many women political leaders in the current kind of political dynamics going on in Slovakia? Of the, I mean, the Slovak party landscape is yeah. a nightmare to every analyst. It's a complete nightmare because we have so many parties, newly emerging parties, old parties going into coalition with, with a party you never heard their name about. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend, Karen, Dr. Karen Henderson, she is the specialist when you have a question about party con contemporary party politics. She reads Slovak politics like the back of her hand. So I'm always uh, absolutely amazed. Um, as far as I can tell, yes, you're right, of course, the president is a woman, Susanna Chaputova, a studied lawyer and a mother um, um, bringing up a child on her own. She's divorced. And then there are a couple of younger women at the higher party echelons, but don't ask me what these parties are called or what they stand for. It is a nightmare. You would have to go and they have now learned something which is admirable. They do not only get active shortly before the parliamentary elections like they used to in the 90s and early 2000s. There were three years you didn't hear from anybody, but a year before the next parliamentary, they got active. It's an old relict from Hungarian times, you know, no need to, to no need to do advertising or winning over citizens for membership. Uh, let's just be pragmatic and get engaged a year before the parliamentary election. That has improved. So now you can hear every day, you can, um, of course, the latest thing is the COVID. And that has sparked a lot of, a lot of, uh, of course, protests. Then the, the murder of Kuciak and his fiancée, that was, that won Chaputo the presidency because people, and they are still fed up. And I do understand that for a normal citizen going to work, being afraid to lose his job or his little enterprise that he engaged in because of the COVID strategy. And then you witness how corrupt the regime, not, not, not only the politicians, but also the police force. There was a case in the police force recently convicted to, um, I think, 17 years of prison. Corrupt prosecutors, corrupt special agents of the, of the, of the secret service. The co and still Slovakia, the last time I checked, is still, when you look at the, the it's not the Freedom House, it's the corruption uh, index, I think, by, done by the economist. Transparency International. Last time I checked, they were still less corrupt than Italy. Italy is one of the oldest member of the European Union. They are, in Italy, this is not corruption. To them, it's normal. It's normal that you don't pay the taxes. It's normal that you bribe police officers. To them, it's a way of life. To us, it's corrupt. And yet, of course, it, it helps only those who have funds enough or rich enough. In Slovakia, one can say, and I keep asking my friends, so what was actually the best government thinking back? And many of them, regardless what party uh, membership they have or what profession or profession they have, many now look back, oh, Fizzo. Of course he was corrupt too, but not to the extent like other governments. I mean, they all stole, but the Fizzo government didn't steal as much. And that already, that's already to them a reason to say that was the best government. And don't forget that Fizzo was a clever young man from a communist family. The communists co-opted him and built up his political career. And he then, after the Velvet Revolution, supported Mechiar. Mechiar, who thought of himself as the father of the nation. But what Mechiar lacked, Fizzo had. That's why they voted him in. Mechiar is out of politics. He can't handle it. But to be fair, when we look back at the summer of 1992, when Klaus and Mechiar separated the country, and that was a peaceful political arrangement and decision. 
Klaus did not want to be bothered with those Slovaks and uh, the heavy, heavy, huge um, state-owned factories. How do you privatize that? You have to, you have to sack people, not five, ten, or fifty. You have to sack hundreds of them. Hundreds are going to be unemployed, and Mechier knew that, and he drove a hard bargain so that Klaus, who is a studied economist, Mechier is a lawyer. Although that's sometimes hard to believe when you hear him talking. <laughs> but uh, for the Slovaks, I think Mechia made the right decision. There, were, there was so much bad blood between the two nations from the past that it was hard sometimes to see what they had in common. And now I think the Slovaks, they had them to take responsibility for their own country. And that was good. They learned how to do it. They achieved EU membership. They very financially disciplined, uh, achieved the acquis communautaire of the European Union, became a member, NATO member, firmly in the West, in Euro-Atlantic structures. And looking back now, they get along much better with each other, the Czechs and the Slovaks. A lot of Czechs are going to holiday in the Tatra mountains. Many young Slovaks go to Prague to study. And I think the two nations are now in a, it's a much nicer, a much more friendlier relation than when they were forced to live together. And of course, the Czechs were 10 million, the Slovaks five. Uh, the Confederation was the last attempt to save Czechoslovakia. It didn't work. Yeah, well, in regards to to the parties, we actually back in May we actually had a we had two um, two speakers talk about Slovak political parties, and they and they did show a chart of they had traced the the parties that had come and gone, and it was a mm -hmm. very very complicated chart <laughs> that they presented. But uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, and I would encourage everyone to take a look at. We do have that presentation on our YouTube channel, so you can access it too. And you can see that chart too. And uh, so, um, so are there any are there any additional questions from the audience here today? Um, you can ask Josette directly if you if you choose to. I'll pipe up with one more. Uh, Josette, are there any notable Slovak women's organizations today that um, are making a difference nationwide? I would, yes, I would say there is, not, of course, the, I don't know of any other because I didn't look further than Shivina. Shivina is still very much active. Today in Martin, I go to Martin every year in July to go to the library, National Library. Uh, Shivina, of course, with the new technology at our disposal. Um, Shivina is engaging very much to, um, for enlightenment, to, 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 it's probably not not really a feminist feminist endeavor any longer, but they are the representative of the Slovak women. Although, of course, a historical association, but I think it's admirable that the association is still existing today. And when I interviewed Mrs. Vasharyova, um, she told me, yeah, it's about the political education. And she knows what she's talking about uh, because she, when she travels the countryside, um, people in Bratislava are well educated. They have access in the countryside. They have a different kind of life. They have a different lifestyle. It's not so hectic like in Bratislava or in Kosice. People they have tend to their food garden. Uh, in the Catholic regions or in Catholic um, villages, they're conservative. So when Charter 77 finally was founded, uh, nobody in Slovakia knew what that was. And even after the Velvet Revolution, many Slovaks were completely uninformed, although that was available now in the new newspapers after the revolution, they thought Charter 77, oh, what was that good for? You know, very narrow-minded. And I think that's one of the main, main goals uh, Shivina is still tackling today. But I would have to, I would have to do more research on that, on other women's associations, Apart from the professional association, for example, 
the Association of Slovak Psychiatrists, of course, women are their normal members like, like the men, but Jivina is the only one I know of, uh, of that standing. All right, we have uh, time for one last question. So one last chance here, if you want to ask Josette directly. All right. May I? Yes, please. Yes, please. Hello, this is this is Susanna Steen, and um, I'm currently the vice president of the American Sokol Washington, D.C., and I've been here since late 1990s uh, living on the East Coast, but I go home every summer. I'm one quarter Slovak and three quarters Czech. And every time I go to the Czech Republic, I visit Slovakia as well. My relatives there. It's interesting, your observations. I, I really appreciate this session. Um, when you talked about bribing, um, my cousin in Slovakia who delivered a baby a few, you know, just three, four years ago, she felt like she had to bribe the doctors mm -hmm. to give her epidural. And I was like, why did you give them such a fat envelope with money? And she's like, they wouldn't give me the epidural otherwise, mm -hmm. or they wouldn't take care of me. And I just thought it was so backwards. I never heard of it even in the Czech Republic. But one thing I just wanted to say here in the US or at least you know on the East Coast through our so-called organization and, and some other you know events that we have for the Czech and Slovak society and you know friends and relatives there it's like as if we were not a separate country. We still have kind of we still operate with Czechoslovakia on our mind and you know and even our kids here you know it's it's like as if we were, you know, one nation still. Um, and, you know, my sons, they, you know, they can speak both, you know, Czech and Slovak and, and sometimes even more so they feel connection to Slovakia more so than, uh, you know, their relatives in, or, you know, their friends in Czech Republic. So, you know, just kind of glad to see that we continue this, this partnership and friendship, at least in the, you know, social life. Thank you very much. It was very interesting for me to learn so that the, the, the exiles in the US still have this um, kind of like this ideal picture that that's absolutely admirable. I have heard a complete opposite from my Slovak friends here in Switzerland uh, in the in the when when it was the president, uh, not um, the parliamentary election in 98 when the Jurinda coalition won. Uh, one friend told me who was an adherent of Zurinda, center-right Christian Democrats. And he fled in 68 and he started pharmacy and engineer and uh, he has made his wealth, a beautiful wife, two kids, clever kids. And he told me he had almost had a fist fight in a bar when a couple of Slovaks uh, gathered on Friday night to have a couple of drinks and discuss. And then this political argument arose. And one guy was a, an ardent defender of Mechiar, and they almost went at each other with fist like <laughs> in Switzerland. Imagine that in Switzerland. And so heated was, was that debate. So I'm really absolutely enjoying what you just told us now today that, um, that they live in peace together and, uh, uh, and that they come home from time to time. I'm absolutely also find it fantastic that they speak both Czech and Slovak because the young Slovaks today uh, not those who are going to Prague to study, of course, but I mean, I'm Swiss. I studied Russian, then I studied Czech. Then I learned, I went to Slovakia for my academic career. The first evening, I'm zapping. Czech television, Slovenska Televizia. After two hours, I could not remember what I heard in what language. They are so mm -hmm. close. And I don't have a mother or a father. And I studied Czech um, at, in my 20s. So that there are still young people who speak and Czech and Slovak, uh, that it's absolutely fantastic to hear that. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anyone else wants to add, add a comment or a question, uh, this is your chance. Okay. Um, so, so Josette, I would like to thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your for your for your great presentation and and your answers to the questions today. It's, it was a really enjoyable presentation, and I like to remind everyone that this uh, presentation will be will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel pretty soon, 
So keep an eye out for that. And I will uh, I will mail out the link to all the all the folks that registered for today's event. So so I would like to wish everyone a a a, a lovely evening or a lovely afternoon, depending on where you are. And so hopefully you'll join us again at our next talk. So um, so everyone have a great day. Thank you Bye. very much to all of you. Thank you very much. Have a good, great weekend. Thank you.